All right, Michael, I really appreciate you for doing the interview. Thank you so much. Um, you know, gotten to know you a little bit here over the years, but hoping to know you more after this conversation. Um, maybe let us know, you know, who you are, what you do, and a little bit about yourself. Sure. So my name is Michael Desplaines. I'm the president and CEO of Norfolk Botanical Garden. We are one of the largest botanical gardens in the country. We are of the 600 that are part of the National Coalition of Gardens. We are in the top 50, both by acreage and budget size. So we're considered one of the biggest gardens in the country. I've got a background in horticulture, but most of my nonprofit background was actually um, working with people, YMCA and public schools. Later on in my career, I would work in historic uh, house uh, museums and would get my master's in historic preservation. So I've got this love of horticulture, love of the built environment, love of history. I've always been environmentalist, always had a green thumb as a kid, always loved the outdoors as a kid. I grew up in the city. I grew up south of Boston. So uh, in Pro uh, Pawtucket, just north of Providence. Um, but I always loved the outside, the backyard and, and gardening. So um, that's a little bit about me. Yeah. No, that's great. I appreciate that. And then what would you say is like, uh, you know, do you have any early childhood memories with horticulture or? Oh, definitely. So all of my relatives were great gardeners. My mom is from uh, Canada. She's from Eastern Canada and all of her relatives were farmers. So being a kid and going up there in the summers and visiting aunts and uncles who had farms and pigs and kittens and puppies and animals and riding the tractor with my uncle. And I remember one of my aunts uh, who just recently passed away, uh, grabbing a pitchfork and saying, come with me and taking me to the side garden where we dug potatoes and just seeing the miracle of these potatoes come up out of the ground was just as a kid was just incredible to me. Um, I remember really young, maybe five years old my parents taking us camping at a state park and they had a nature walk and talk you know sort of like ranger rick takes you out and you walk around and i remember how cool i thought the park ranger was his uniform and he showed us you know sundews and carnivorous plants and that was it i mean i was hooked um and my godmother sending me seeds in the mail to plant my own garden and not knowing that the seeds, they were dried up inside the dead flower head. I didn't know where the seeds were. So going to the neighbor who was, uh, she was a World War II GI bride from Germany and saying, hey, Mrs. Hunter, I know you're good at gardens. Where are the seeds in here? And she showed me how you open the marigold and there are the dried seeds inside. And I mean, it's just, it was fascination from day one. Um, volunteering in high school for the local uh, Audubon Society had a wildlife refuge. It was actually an old farm that they had saved, 200 acre farm, volunteering there, um, you know, and just one thing led to another. Boy Scouts being outside, going to camp, um, and then eventually deciding mm -hmm. to study horticulture and going to the University of Rhode Island to, to do that. And you talked about your nonprofit experience. Definitely. Um, yeah. Well, yeah it, it was unique in that it wasn't plant based at first. So, I graduated college in the early 90s. There weren't a lot of jobs around. There was a recession at the time. And I was I took a job with Corporate America licensing stockbrokers for a financial firm. I hated it, you know, stuck at a desk all day. Where'd you go to college? Uh, University of Rhode Island. So that's in Kingston, Rhode Island. And I, you know, I did that first. I did the stockbroker licensing thing for mm -hmm. three years. Hated it. Uh, and there was an ad in the paper that said Earth Service Corps, YMCA, Greater Fall River. And I thought Earth Service, that kind of sounds environmental. So, you know, that was the old days pre, pre internet. Um, that had to have been, God, mid nineties at this point, mid to late nineties. So I sent, you know, I, I sent an application and sure enough, it was, it was an Earth, it was an AmeriCorps program. So AmeriCorps is sort of like the domestic Peace Corps. And it was at a inner city YMCA and it was running an environmental education program for in, inner city middle age school kids. So they hired me. I had no experience teaching kids anything. I mean, I had worked at an herb farm when I was in high school and 
did tours and classes there. So I, I had some experience, you know, talking and teaching about plants. But the Y had great resources. AmeriCorps had great resources. The program through the YMCA was called the Earth Service Corps. It was sort of like, it was the service learning model. So learning by doing. The Y has a long history of stewardship around public, around lands because of their camping program. You know, YMCA's have had camps for, for um, since they started as a movement in the early 1900s. Yeah. Uh, and it was really great. And it was a great organization to work for because they promoted from within. They valued talent. They trained you. They and they said to you, "We value you. We 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 see something in you. We would like to keep you and train you to become a leader." Um, and I'll never forget that because a lot of those skills I use today as a nonprofit leader, I learned at the Y. I learned how to do a budget for the first time. I learned how to manage people and human resources, risk management. If you think everything the Y does involves people and kids and families and high risk things, to exercise, swimming, camp. And they're very good about risk management, um, but they're also good about learning how to manage risk and not let risk manage you, you know, that that, that you can still have um, both really important in my career has helped me a lot. Fundraising, they're, they're usually the national leaders around fundraising. They're usually tied with the Salvation Army and the Red Cross for some of the highest fundraisers in the country. And that's because the YMCA has a mission that regardless of ability to pay, you can use the WISE resources. So they have to fundraise that operational difference. Uh, I stayed with the Y. I got promoted within the Y. Um, I eventually sort of hit the glass ceiling in the Y. Mm -hmm. And then I went to go work for the public school in the, in the same city that I was working at that YMCA as a director <laughs> of 21st Century Community Learning Centers. These, mm -hmm. This was federal money to keep middle schools open after school to provide programming for kids and their families, homework help. Uh, we did hip hop dance, graffiti art, you know, all kinds of cool stuff. Nice. And then we bust them all home at five o'clock. It was a really great program. And I did that for about three years. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, what's your day to day like now? What, what's your team like? Oh, that's a great question. So, um, you know, the, a botanical garden is a lot like any other museum in that we have a collection, right? And and in our sense, our collection isn't necessarily art hanging on the wall, but it's a living collection of plants. And then, so I have to have, a, you know, a team that manages that collection and takes care of it. And we look to add the collection. But then because we're open to the public, I also have to have all of the support services that support uh, over half a million people a year who come here. So visitor services and facilities and moving people around campus and then the revenue streams that support that business so we can stay open to fulfill our mission. So weddings, special events, retail, fundraising, um, all of that. So I, I say it's, you know, it's like running a museum. It's like running a retail. It's like running a wedding operation. Uh, we have an on-site restaurant. I mean, you name it, we have it. So it's really multifaceted. Um, typical day for me is the same as any other CEO emails and meetings, right? Um, I think I read Harvard Business Review, 80% of a CEO's time is spent in a meeting. Um, more recently, certainly the last three to four years has been fundraising. We're, we're in the middle of, we're finishing a huge capital campaign to expand the garden. It's called the Garden of Tomorrow. So a lot of my time is met with um, people in the community asking them to help support our vision to expand the garden. Yeah, that's awesome. Whose career have you been inspired by? Oh, that's a great question. So I've learned a lot from different people. I picked up things here and there. I'd say one of my first mentors was uh, Buddy Evans. In fact, I was just talking to a, a someone who knew him yesterday at my Rotary Club. Uh, he was my the first YMCA director I worked for. You know, he was the one who took a pad and a pen and taught me how to do a budget. You know, you've got two staff members at $10 an hour at 40 hours a week. This is how much their salary is. You know, I, if you've never done a budget, you know, how, how do you learn that in business and especially in a nonprofit business? So he taught me a lot of that. Um, and then I've, you know, I like to read and I like to glean insights from different people. Um, and there's a couple of figures. I don't necessarily, um, you know, adhere to everything that they've said or done, but Jack Welch had a, had a really good saying in business, hire slowly, fire quickly. Um, and I, especially the hire slowly part, really take your time to find the right people. Um, and if also, if somebody's not working out, you can try to train them, you can try, but generally 
it's that you can't teach an old dog new tricks kind of thing. Like people are people are people and you know, you got to get the right fit first rather than trying to make people a fit after the hire. So be really be careful about hiring. Uh, and then Jeff Bezos famously, he said um, whenever he wants to do a new endeavor, he says he asks the three questions, why, what if, and how? Mm -hmm. And I do that all the time in business. Why, what if, how? You know, why are we doing this? What if we did it a different way? How would that look? Um, and I challenge my teams to always think like that. Great book I got as a first time leader was, oh, I might even have it on my bookshelf. I was just going to ask you if you had maybe yeah, a time here it is. of books. This was a great one. This is old. This might even be from the early 2000s. Let's see if I can find a date on it. It is from 2005. Wow. You're in charge. Now what? <laughs> I like that title. This, oh my God, great stuff in here. Um, including introducing yourself to your new management team, some practices you can do with them, some exercises you can do with them, great interview questions. Um, I've gleaned a lot from that book. That's from a board chair I had, Judy Gideons, when I was running the tiny little historic garden, three acre garden and historic house, 1840 house in Western Maine. It's called McLaughlin Garden. And when I was promoted to be the executive director there, she got me that book. And it's fantastic. One of the best leadership books I've ever read. I appreciate you sharing that. What's I your... think you can still get it on Amazon. I suggested it for someone I knew who just got his first uh, ED position out of a botanical garden. Um, but it's a great book. Yeah, that's great. I'm, I'm still trying to finish my exercises in this one right here. This is... Uh... Oh, wow. Laws of Leadership. Oh, yeah, fantastic. I've not read that book. 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership by John Maxwell. <clears throat> um, a lot of like actionable stuff in there. I'm always yeah. like, trying to dig around. So There's also, you know, I've also, I, I, I'm i a big sayings guy. Like I glean on to sort of these one line, two line sayings that have helped me um, let go or get dragged is a good one. If something is driving you nuts, sometimes you just got to let it go. Especially, especially in the nonprofit world, because you're dealing with with large groups of volunteers, you're reporting to a volunteer board, your committees are volunteers, and everyone has these vested interests. And, and there's sometimes tension within that. Um, also, because then you're dealing with paid staff, right? The staff are paid, they're not volunteers, and they're the professionals. So there's sometimes tension. So let go or get dragged um, has been a big one for me. Uh, you know, and other things that I've heard along the way that have just been really good mantras, manage risk, don't let risk manage you. That was a good one I learned at the Y around risk management. Um, you know, it, I, I think as as you grow and learn, you grab onto things that really work for you. And like any, I think like anyone else, and you jettison things that didn't work, right? We can only retain so much. What do you think has been the most like impactful thing you've done for this year? Wow. I think the most impactful thing I've done at the garden would be um, what we've done around the restoration of the historic structures here. I, I've got my master's in historic preservation. So saving old buildings is one of my passions. I think the complete restoration and renovation of the 1961 administration building, which has actually won awards, pretty proud of the fact that we saved NATO tower and rehabilitated it and turned it into this spectacular new feature cobblestone bridge fixing that and then also um breaking ground um hopefully in a, in a week or two on you know a 30 million dollar expansion <laughs> of the world, especially the twenty six thousand square foot conservatory where we'll work to help rescue and save some of the rarest plants on earth i think that's what i'm most proud of didn't happen in the last year it's been eight years in the making with the help from hundreds and hundreds of people including a phenomenal staff here. Um, but that's certainly one thing I'm, I'm proud of. Um, certainly, I think anyone who is inspired by our work here and becomes a conservationist or environmentalist or plants a tree, that's probably the thing I'm the most proud of. If you planted something as a result of something we did here, or you heard me say, amen, I think that's the most important thing is greening this planet. And how are you thinking about sustainability and what what are some tips? Yeah, so I think, Hamilton, I think we're way past sustainability. Sustainability means we're going to stay here. We have to actually be regenerative. 
So we as a society have been extractive for so long where we've just extracted the earth's resources and we put very little back in. Even our own trash doesn't go back into the nutrient stream, right? We, we bury it in a landfill where it's entombed forever and those nutrients don't get recycled back into the earth. And it's we're a closed loop, right? So things should decay and go. the nutrients go back into the soil just like wood. We don't even let our own bodies decay, right? We embalm them, we put them in a box, we put that box in a cement box. We're not even going back into the earth. So at some point the earth will become out of balance. So we need to become regenerative. We need to be putting more things into the earth than we take out. Mm. So things like planting more trees, planting more plants, composting, less extraction, more about renewables. I think that's really where we need to be. Um, it's, it's, I think we're way past sustainability as a buzzword because our current life, and we saw this with COVID, what we do is not sustainable. We, we can't live like this. Are there any tips for someone at home that might can get started? Is it as simple as planting a house plant? It's a, or, exactly. So or I think it's as simple it. as anywhere you can put a plant, add a plant, <laughs> green is good. So if you're renting, if you have a patio, put something on the patio. Um, if you have a little yard and you're renting, ask the landlord, is it okay if I plant something in the yard? I'll water it. I'll take care of it. Most landlords would welcome that and it would actually raise the, their property value, or if you have your own land, do it. I always think when you're approached with a choice, what's the more environmental choice? Everything that you do in the daytime. So shopping of the two items I'm gonna buy, which one has the least impact, which is the most recyclable, which is the better uh, footprint. So, you know, like liquid detergent in a plastic bottle, using water, it's heavy, uh, carbon, a plastic bad, you know, or do I buy powder detergent in a box? Well, the box is paper, no water, it's lighter, it's more concentrated, things like that. That's an, that's an easy decision, but buy the thing that's more environmental. Packaging aluminum is the way to go. Aluminum is the, is the lightest. So it's less shipping and it's the most recycled material on the on earth. Very little plastic, only 9% gets actually made into something new. Same with glass about 75, I, I think the latest figure heard was 34% of glass is recycled. It's heavy. So just try and avoid those things. Bring your own bag. I mean, it's the thing we've been, I've been saying since the 90s at the YMCA, you know, uh, avoid plastic, reusable, uh, less is more. Green power, everyone can sign up through Arcadia Power to get green power uh, in their homes for only five bucks more a month. Who, who wouldn't do that? Um, they're an energy aggregator. They buy green energy credits on the open market. Um, Dominion has energy credits as well, green energy credits where, yeah, you can't put up a windmill at your house or solar on your roof maybe, but you can offset your own carbon with green. Uh, things like that. Drive less. We all drive too much. Carpool, less trips, <laughs> things like that. Switch to electric next time you buy a car. New electric cars are 35 grand now. I mean, that's what most people are paying for a four-door sedan now anyway. That's a gas goes there. So I haven't bought gas in three years, four years next month, September. You know how much money I've saved? No, that's great. That's like a whole blog post there, Michael. That's oh, it's like, nuts. Yeah, it's nuts. <clears throat> that's a, and it was like, oh, well, you're rich. You can afford that car. I said, there, the sticker's 35000 What did you pay for your monster truck or your four-door sedan? You know, and they tell me, and I'm like, exactly. You could have bought this. So just, I think just choices. That's the best thing that people can do is just choices. What skills would your peers or maybe your board, what would they say are your top like three skills? Oh, that I have, that you I'd have. say, yeah, I'd say communication. I think I can tell us, I can tell our story pretty impactfully. And I think as a leader, you have to have a good verbal communication. Um, I think I'm a good fundraiser. And I think that's because I, I tell the story and I believe in the story. Fundraising is just telling the story of your organization and getting people to invest in that story. That's all it is. I don't necessarily write the story. For 85 years, people have written the story of Norfolk Botanical Garden and what we do here. I just need to tell that story. Um, and then I hope they'd say that I'm a good business leader. We've made some really good business decisions. The garden, we tripled our budget. Um, visitations over half a million. We're profitable every year. So I hope they would also say that that I can also run a, a successful um, business that 
doesn't need to fundraise just to keep the doors open. Yeah, that's great. And the fundraising piece, I, I want to stick there for a little bit. What would you sure. say is um, <clears throat> why do funders fund? Why, why do they? Why are you funded? Like, what is the thing that yeah. makes them say yes? So I learned at the YMCA, right? Because they always had to raise money every year to pay for those scholarship kids who came and needed they needed child care or camp or the gym. So um, we, I learned very early that number one, people don't give unless they're asked, right? So no one's just going to give you money unless you ask them. You need to ask them and you need to have a compelling reason as to why you're asking. I'm not asking for me, but I'm asking for that kid who comes here and would really love a day of nature. So I want to be able to scholarship that kid to come here free of charge. Um, I think the other thing around fundraising is you might not give right away. It takes several times for me to touch you either through our materials or through your experience here or through hearing about what we do uh, for you to actually then decide to make a gift. So to keep at it, you know, it's not just a one and done. Sometimes you've got to keep engaging with potential um, donors. Um, and then I thirdly remember anyone could be a donor. You have, you never know who you're talking to. One of my predecessors at the, the little McLaughlin garden in Western Maine tells a story or told me a story about a guy was running by the uh, garden and the cafe was closed that day. He came in and he was dying and he wanted a drink. He was hot and thirsty. <laughs> and the girl who was working said, oh, the cafe's closed today. You know, there's no beverages. And the director had come in at that time and she's like, oh, let me, I hold on, I'll go into the kitchen. I'll get you a glass of iced tea, don't worry about it. So she got him a glass of iced tea. He's like, how much? She's like, don't worry about it, it's iced tea. Well, he was a lawyer for a foundation. He flew back to Los Angeles after his vacation in Western Maine and sent the garden a check for $10,000. Just like that. So a, a $10,000 glass of iced tea. So you never know who you're talking to. You never know who's going to be impacted by your work. Um, and everyone is a donor, you know, whether it's 10 cents or 10,000, all that money helps up to support the cause that hopefully you're passionate about. Because if you're not passionate about it, then you shouldn't be trying to get other people to invest in it. No, that's really good. That's a great story. What would you think? You, what would you do if you weren't doing this work? What, what would you? Oh do? my God, that's a great question. I <laughs> joke that I I I, I want to move to Hawaii and open a poke shack and call it OK Poke. Oh, and if okay. people ask me, you know, how's your poke? I go, it's okay. Yeah. If I they buy it, great. And if they don't, I'm fine with that. Um, but no, food service is not easy. I do not want to have a food service. You know, I don't know. It's a, I, I often say this is a dream job. And I when I get together with my peers around the country, we usually get together once a year, the 75 largest gardens in the country. And we all talk about how blessed we are, that we are so fortunate to get to do what we do because there's so few of us that get to run large botanical gardens in the country. Um, I think I would be in the nonprofit space. I really do. Um, I like to make a paycheck. Obviously, I have bills to pay and I, I, I want to be able to support myself. But I also like to make a difference. And I've been that way since the late 90s. I, I've been a nonprofit guy since the late 90s for that same exact reason, making a paycheck, but making a difference. So it, while it might not be a botanical garden, it would definitely be some sort of nonprofit. I, I love this world, though. I can't imagine working in a different world. Um, you know, I joke that my dream job would be a, a, a combination art, flower and coffee shop all in one. You know, mm -hmm. I would sell fine art, coffee and flowers, um, you know, and, but again, those are all retail is a hard, it, it, all of those are individually very hard businesses, but um, and um, yeah, I'm super happy doing what I'm doing. And, and I know you talked about the Garden of Tomorrow, but do you want to, you know, plug any big projects you're working yeah, on? Yeah, right so it's 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 our largest expansion in history. It's a it's over thirty million dollars. We are looking to expand. It's sort of threefold: expand our current parking lot to go from about four hundred to five hundred cars, but to do it in a very environmentally um, friendly way. We're turning the parking lot into a parking garden, so we're actually going to plant seventy five trees in that new parking garden. So there'll be a about one tree for every seven cars. Um, lots of permeability. We'll be keeping the rain in the parking lot. The, the parking lot water will water the trees. Um, uh, we'll do a new entry pavilion. The toll booth at the front is just, is the advent of the seventies when we lost the parking lot for this visitor center, which is the original 1960s visitor center. Um, so we'd like to fix that. It's 
very unwelcoming, can't ask questions, sell a membership, all of that. And you're stuck behind a line of cars that are idling, also not great for the planet. So walk-in ticketing pavilion. We'd also uh, add a new bistro uh, to do really great food service here. Um, maybe even three meals, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And then really the crown jewel is the 26,000 square foot conservatory. We would have a biome for tropical plants, a biome for desert plants. We would have two special exhibit wings of that <laughs> conservatory. Of the five most threatened living things on earth right now, three are actually plants, cactus, hmm. cycads, and conifers. So we're already working hard with conifers, with longleaf pine, Cactus is actually the most threatened living thing on earth right now. So the desert biome would help us showcase and help save some of those. We, we could be a backup collection for our partners in conservation around the world in case they get hit by a natural disaster or climate change. And cycads are like palms. They're just a very primitive form of a palm. Sago palm, for instance, a lot of, a lot of us have as a house plant or even an outdoor plant here is actually a cycad. Um, and the tropical biome would help us highlight that. Uh, the whole conservatory is gonna be threatened. The theme is threatened coastal uh, environments of the world. So think Baja Mexico, think uh, Hawaii, uh, Pacifica, you know, we're a threatened coastal region. So we're gonna highlight other threatened coastal regions around the world and featuring their plants. Caribbean cactus, very rare, very endangered. Uh, and then of course, It'll be indoors, so this incredible place to come in the off season to to see and feel and breathe and touch plants when um, when it's not so nice outside. Yeah, no, that sounds great. And that said, I mean, how do you how do you want to be remembered? Oh my God, I hope number one as an environmentalist. I hope the first thing people realize is that since I was a five-year-old, I was into the planet and plants and the outdoors and the importance of nature and connecting to nature that we are part of the natural world. We are not separate from it. We are animals in this world together. Uh, that would be number one. Um, number two, that I was a builder in a way. I fixed things, I made things better. I built things in a way though that was environmental and sensitive. Um, and thirdly, I guess as an educator that hopefully I pass something on uh, to someone like that park ranger who inspired me when I was a kid. I hope I've done that to a kid or two uh, in my career. That's that's how I think I'd like to be remembered. That's great. Where can we follow you and where can we connect with you? Oh, that's a good question. So any of the garden social media, um, you can follow me um, the, and Norfolk Botanical Garden. We've got a great website, Facebook, Instagram um and i make appearances on there occasionally I, I i think it's more important to talk about the flowers and less about um me um but definitely on on those three we've got a great website too it's got a great three minute video it animates all of the things that we're building so people can see what they look like um the construction trailer is already here we should be moving dirt in a couple of weeks we hope everything should be open in less than two years 18 months to 24 months that's beautiful. Thank you so much for this, Michael. You're so welcome. And and also what you do around upcycling, recycling, spreading the word, using fashion to, to move the envelope, I think is huge. I think design and art that inspires change is the best design and art. So you certainly epitomize that. I appreciate the kind words. That's great.